Welcome, everybody. Hopefully you can hear me. Uh, welcome to our public meeting on public transport, privatisation and poverty. It's great to see so many people here, We're over 100 now, which is really amazing. I'm Ellie Harrison. I'm the current chair of Get Glasgow Moving. And for those of you who don't know us, we are a volunteer run campaign founded in 2016 to demand better public transport for everybody in our region. So we were just watching a little video there. Hope you enjoyed it. That was put together by Neil, who's on our committee, showing a little bit of his, the history of our campaign. Membership of Get Glasgow Moving is open to anybody who wants to support our demand for a world-class, fully integrated and affordable public transport network for Greater Glasgow. And Gavin is going to post a link in the chat now if you'd like to find out more, because immediately after the public meeting concludes at eight, we'll be holding our third annual general meeting for new and existing members where you can find out more about our campaign activities over the last year and find out how to get involved. So I just wanted to start by saying a few words about why now during COVID, it might seem a bit strange to be talking about public transport in the middle of a pandemic, when we've all been instructed to stay at home and not to travel. But of course, COVID has shown us that public transport is the essential public service that we always knew it was to get key workers to their jobs. And COVID has also exposed the absurdities of running public transport on a for-profit basis. In Scotland, we've given more than 300 million pounds in public subsidies to private bus companies during the pandemic, yet they still get to decide which routes they run. It's an incredibly inefficient use of public money, not to mention all of the other injustices which we're gonna be looking at tonight. So Get Glasgow Moving and many campaigns like us up and down the UK are demanding big changes to our public transport to radically transform the way that it's run. And it's gonna take several years to deliver these changes. So now, actually, while there's a lull in bus use, is the perfect time to begin. So for those of you who aren't aware of uh, public transport history, the buses in most parts of the UK were deregulated in 1986 and then went on to be privatised at different points in the 1990s. So since then, we have literally lost millions of miles of bus routes and fares have been hiked up as much as the private bus companies can get away with. And we've been left with a patchwork of competing private companies running different parts of the network. And there is zero planning done in the public interest to coordinate timetables, to plan the routes and to regulate the fares. And of course, it's the poorest in our society that are being exploited the most, and particularly in Glasgow, where we have such low levels of car ownership and so many people completely dependent on the bus. So this slide says it all, really. Privatised buses are simply more expensive for passengers. A single in Glasgow costs one whole pound more than in London, where bus routes, uh, bus routes and fares are planned and regulated in the public interest by Transport for London. So it's not difficult to see how this exacerbates poverty, but in Glasgow, the situation is so much worse because our buses are now so bad that they've come to be seen as something that you would only use if you just did not have any other options. So in Glasgow, not only does the extortionate cost of our buses cause poverty, but the buses in Glasgow become stigmatised and associated with poverty. And this is the opposite of what we need to do to build a more equal and sustainable city. To address the climate emergency we're facing and to tackle the persistent poverty in our city, we need a world-class public transport system everyone uses. Instead of forcing people to buy cars that they can't afford for want of other options, so that is a bit of the local context. I'm now going to move on to introduce our very uh, special guest. We're really excited. Live from New York, we're very pleased to welcome Professor Philip Alston. 
Philip Alston is a lawyer and the co-chair of New York University's Law School Center for Human Rights and Global Justice. And in 2014, he was appointed the UN, UN's Special Rapporteur on Extreme Poverty and Human Rights. And he served in that role for six years, during which time he made an official visit to the UK in 2018. So he's going to tell us a bit more about that visit now and the new research that he and his team are now undertaking into the human rights impacts of the UK's deregulated bus system. So I'm gonna stop sharing now and hand over to Philip. Welcome, Philip. Uh, thank you very much, Ellie. Um, it's uh, a great pleasure to, uh, to be able to uh, to, to join you tonight. Um, as you said, um, my various interests, I guess, started off with a, a concern uh, to expose and try to get greater attention to the elimination of poverty. Uh, but that I see as very much part of a broader effort to secure the recognition and the realization of social rights as rights. That in turn then links up to a broader array of issues, <clears throat> um, which are the ways in which we are shaping our economies these days, uh, and particularly the role of the public sector in doing that. Uh, and all of this is, as you said, in relation to COVID, um, influenced not only by the lessons that we are drawing right now from the COVID uh, crisis, but also the uh, ever-growing realization of the absolute urgency of climate change and the need to respond to it, and the move whether by um, the new Biden administration belatedly, but certainly by the European Union, also by the British government, uh, to really start thinking about what a green economy looks like. So one of the issues that I, I would want to mention, I shouldn't start with this, but I'll put it on the table, is of course this broader strategic question of whether one starts with poverty or starts more broadly, uh, there's always the risk that when we are highlighting the plight of low income people, we end up um, appealing to a rather limited part of the society. We end up pointing to the really hard cases and bizarrely and perversely, we end up having difficulty getting sympathy because the well-off just say, well, I've got better things to do than worry about those outliers as the economists call them. Um, and it is true that this is a moment where public transport should be very much on the center of the public agenda not just because of poverty, although I'll talk about that in a moment, since that's what I was hired to do, uh, but also uh, because public transport has to be an absolutely central part of any effort to really roll back global warming and to really set up some sort of new vision of the sort of society that we want to build. To come back to the poverty dimension briefly, as you mentioned, Ellie, uh, I visited the United Kingdom in 2018 in my capacity as UN Special Rapporteur on Extreme Poverty and Human Rights. Um, I started off, of course, in London. Uh, one has to start in London for diplomatic reasons apart from anything else. Um, and transport wasn't a particularly large issue. I went off and I went to Wales, but then the first British town that I spent much time in was Bristol. 
And I first visited the United Kingdom, including Scotland, in 1976, which was before many of you were born. And you wouldn't know that 1976 was one of the historic years that you'll find marked in the calendar uh, when the entire summer was sunny and warm. Um, and I developed a very romantic notion of the British countryside uh, and spent time in some really gorgeous uh, small towns in Scotland, but also in England. So to be at this meeting in Bristol and for people to say, let me tell you how grim it is to live in this country town. Uh, I can't get to the unemployment center I can't get to the only job that I've been offered. I can't get to the doctor. I can't even get to the supermarket. Uh, and it's all because uh, the wave of privatization eliminated the public transport options that were previously available. Uh, you know, I met people uh, struggling up the hill to get to the food bank in Newcastle and I said, but hang on, there's a bus system that uh, comes pretty close to this, which I guess is one reason for locating it here. And of course, the answer was, yeah, good luck to you, mate. If you can afford the bus, you're doing well. Um, and so even where there were bus routes, the affordability issue just precluded even, or particularly people who were the most in need of it. And I remember saying to, a junior ministry minister uh, in Westminster. What do you think of public transport? These are the stories that I heard. Well, my good man, transport is not a function of government. Transport is for people to buy for themselves. We're not here to provide all of these different things. And I think that really goes to the heart of the issue that should be on the agenda here. Is transport a luxury? Is transport a need? Or is transport a right? And of course, I think we have to see it as both a need and a right. But I think we have to see it as very much part of a, an obligation of government uh, just as government provides roads because people can't be stranded and unable to get to work or to school or whatever, so too they have to ensure that there is a bus system and other forms of public transport which perform those functions. The theory, of course, is so it doesn't matter then if it's public or private. And I'm still back at that unfortunate point of saying, yeah, that's true in theory, there's a small problem. And that is that virtually every study that is done of privatized services ends up pointing first to the fact that the grand promises that were made about regulation uh, and the role that government will play and the consultation with the public and so on, and the continuing scrutiny they almost never, ever, ever come to pass. There are always reasons why once a government has washed its hands of responsibility, that's it. It doesn't come back, it doesn't work. And then of course, there's the simply the practical question. So how's it gone, privatization? And I started looking at that quite separately and again, another anecdote, but it brings it alive. I did a report on privatization. I concluded that there were almost no studies that were able to vindicate all of the claims that were made for the superiority of private provision. And I had a, a researcher working with me, she's a very smart woman, happened to be Australian, but that was coincidental. She's, I, Professor, I don't like your study. It's too negative. You don't give enough credit to the private sector. Great. Ellen, come back in two weeks. Spend the two weeks searching for positive studies. 
case studies that demonstrate the superiority of private provision, particularly for low income people, but not only. She came back two weeks later and she said, you're right, there's almost nothing out there. And of course, it's not an accident. The World Bank and others say, we don't study this because we're more concerned to make sure that this works for the economy as a whole. Well, how you can separate the economy as a whole from lower income people for whom a system of privatization by definition is not designed uh, is beyond me. And so let me finish just by saying, I do think we need to start presenting public transport as a human right, uh, not just something for poor people, but something which enables uh, a fullness to life, uh, just as public libraries and various other uh, important elements that have been assaulted during the era of austerity, particularly in England, but not only, so too public transport has to be put back at the center of the agenda. Let me finish. Uh, I think, Ellie, you are probably going to do this just by uh, introducing my uh, colleague, Bassam Hawaja, who's one of the co-directors of the big project on privatization and human rights that we are now running at uh, New York University Law School, uh, and which is now doing a study of uh, bus transport in the UK as one of our case studies. So we plan to be in this for the longer run. Uh, we're just starting our real engagement and we see this as a, an incredibly important issue for Scotland and for the rest of the UK. That was brilliant. Thank you so much, Philip. Um, I'm sure if we can remove the spotlight on you, I think we'll be able to see a virtual round of, the round of applause from all of our participants. Yes, I could see it. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, and it was a real honor to have you um, speaking at our meeting. I, we were gonna take a couple of questions. Um, so if anybody does have a question, we're probably not gonna have time to get through more than two or three, but please do put your question in the chat. I just wanted to kick off, I suppose, <laughs> with a bit of a, a question focusing on, on where we are with our campaign, because we've just spent the last four years um, lobbying the Scottish Parliament for powers to actually re-regulate the buses and to be able to bring buses back into public ownership, which um, those new powers now exist and they were passed by the Scottish Parliament in the um, the Transport Act in 2019. We've now got another struggle on our hands to try to get the council and our regional transport authority, which is called SBT, to actually use the powers because the private bus companies, um, you know, have, have so much power um, in, in the system at the moment. So that's our fight at the moment. And I guess the question for you is, uh, would you be encouraging uh, these powers to be taken up by transport authorities? I think, uh, I mean, the, the real answer to that is that I'm still doing my research. I've read a lot of the, I've certainly read all the literature that you've uh, produced and the various the reports of the uh, Poverty and Inequality Commission and the stuff done by the Poverty Alliance and others. Uh, and this is all incredibly helpful. Um, I guess, and this is not a good answer to your question, Ellie, but the challenge as I see it is not just uh, to um, say, hang on a minute, you guys, the transport we're getting is lousy and therefore we've got to move to public provision. You've got a prior challenge, which is to expose the myth that a transport system run by private operators is more efficient, uh, more innovative, uh, better organized, um, 
more responsive, uh, less corrupt, all of these things which have become part of the, uh, the public perception that is no longer challenged. And yet the reality is that on almost every score, private services score less well. They simply are every bit as subject to corruption uh, of, a, of an overt or an implicit type. They uh, do not provide the sort of investment in future services. They are not forward looking in terms of innovation. They are trying to make profit today. I'm a shareholder. I want me money now. I don't want me money in 10 years time when some visionary idiot has worked. And that, of course, is the perfect recipe for a bad transport system, but good profits for me. And so on so many of these issues, the public needs to be asked to think, look, do you think it's doing better on one, two, three, four? The answer is no. And that's why we need to rethink this. Thank you so much. So many good tips there. So Susan from our committee has been reviewing the questions in the chat and I think you're going to read a couple out, Susan. You're muted at the moment. Can somebody unmute Susan? It's okay. Yeah, there's so many brilliant questions here, Philip, and so little time. Um, so I, I think maybe one of the best questions here is just about um, from your knowledge of around the world, is there any particular place that you've visited that has got a really exemplary public transport system that you think we could be emulating and how, how is that funded and governed? Do you want to read another one, Susan? And um, yeah, and also uh, given the huge environmental impact of car production, um, can you see a time when we have to stop producing cars for private use? Uh, well, uh, thanks, Susan, for those uh, questions. The first, I have to admit that I'm not well equipped to answer. Uh, one of the tragic things is that um, the vast majority of the travel that I've done for the past, uh, I don't know, almost 20 years has been for work. Uh, and that means looking at problems of poverty, looking at problems of human rights and so on. I'm not actually a good tourist, uh, so I don't get to experience uh, a lot of places, and nor am I uh, an expert in comparative public transport. I mean, I suspect that if you go to Berlin, if you go to most places in Germany, you'll find a, an infinitely better public transport system than anything that we would recognize. Uh, but I think if you're a Brit, of course, you could go to a place called London and you'd see a system, you'd say, oh, the tube is uh, overcrowded and the buses don't come often enough. But it's a sort of public transport system that works by comparison to what I read about Glasgow and elsewhere. Uh, and it is carefully, closely regulated, uh, but that's been very hard to achieve in other places. Um, in terms of cars, there's no question that we are moving towards a green economy, not because uh, the well-off want it, but because climate change is applying immense pressures. And finally, climate change is not only screwing the poor, who are the ones who are first hit and have to move and lose their jobs and everything, but it's starting to hit the rich as well. Um, what we see in Texas, uh, you know, a tragedy in Texas, but sorry guys, that's called climate change. I know you think it's a fake. I know you think that it's um, a hoax, uh, but this is exactly what was predicted and get ready for a lot more of it. And that in turn is going to lead us to think, look, is it sustainable to be producing all of these cars, particularly run on fossil fuels? 
uh, rather than moving to other forms of transport. So I think there will be dramatic changes in the next uh, few years, not the distant future. Thank you so much. Philip, I don't know whether you need to get off now <laughs> because we'd love you to stick around for the whole meeting. Uh, we're going to have a few more questions at the very end. Um, Unfortunately, I, I've got to teach. You've got, um, I thought you probably Elliot, did. Uh, but I, Bassam, well, I taught this morning, but I've got another class coming up okay. this afternoon. I occasionally have to earn my living. <laughs> Sorry, um, I was just going to say Bassam's going to stay on, isn't he? Um, in case they've got any questions about the project at the end of the meeting. But thank you so much for joining us. We really That's appreciate great it. It's pleasure. been a great honour. Um, we've had a well, massive turnout. Good luck in... with your work. It's incredibly important. Thank you so much. We'll see you later in the year, hopefully. That would be great. <laughs> Thanks, Abby. Bye. Bye bye. I'm going to take this opportunity, hopefully you can see my screen now, just to, before I introduce our next speaker this evening, I just want to tell you a little bit about Get Glasgow Moving's current struggle, um, which I mentioned briefly before, and that is trying to get Glasgow City Council and SPT to actually use the powers that we have managed to secure in the Transport Act to enable them to re-regulate the bus network or to set up a publicly owned bus company for Greater Glasgow, which can provide the, the same great service that they get in, in Edinburgh with, with publicly owned Lovian buses. So this was us before the lockdown in March 2020. Today, we are launching a new action to encourage all of our supporters to write to your councillors to tell them to stop put the, uh, their plans to pursue a so-called partnership with the private operators, which is what they are um, planning to do at the moment, which is going to lock us into this broken privatised system for years to come if they go down that path. And we'll, it will just be um, devastating to have fought for these powers that we know will improve our public transport and make it run in the interests of, of the people of our city um, for those powers not to be used. So Gavin is gonna post a link in the chat to that new action. And if you do one thing following this meeting, please do this. It'll only take five minutes. We've got a template email, um, which you can just very quickly send off to your representatives. So I'm now going to introduce our next special guest, who is not coming from New York, but from Yorkshire. And it is Fran Poffelswey from the ba Better Buses for uh, South Yorkshire campaign. So for those of you who are at our, our public meeting last year for our AGN, um, you'll know that we focused on campaigning strategies. So last year we had two brilliant speeches from Pascal at Better Buses for Great Manchester and from Emily Yates from the Association of British Commuters. I think they're both on the call with us this evening. So we invited them last year so that we could learn from other struggles um, in different parts of the UK and could also work in solidarity with other grassroots campaigns so that we can learn from each other's campaigning tactics and be inspired by each other's successes and also to build our collective power. So the final half of the meeting today is going to focus on campaigning strategies. So I'm going to hand over to Fran now, who is going to tell you more about their fight to bring the buses in their region back into public control. I'm here. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, Ellie. Sorry, um, I was on the wrong screen then. Uh, am I all right to share the screen? Uh, my yeah. my screen now. Yeah. Uh, let me just see if I can get this up. Um, I hope you can all see that. Yeah. Okay, Ellie. Perfect, yeah? Fran. Perfect. Good. Good. Okay. Um, I was asked to talk about the campaigning that we're doing at the moment, uh, but also sort of where I ended up, where I am now, uh, campaigning around buses. And I just wanted to share uh, some of that journey with you, really, um, because until 2014, I was a very active campaigner on all sorts of issues, 
but to be honest, public transport wasn't very central among the, um, the issues that I was concerned about. And then in 2014, the South Yorkshire uh, Transport Authority decided to slash the situation where elderly and disabled people, apart from having their bus passes that gave them free bus travel, had um, free train travel in the local area. And this is something that had been brought in um, six years or so before. And uh, the small group of retired, uh, retired trade unionists that I was involved in decided this might be an issue that might, uh, people might be quite angry about. So there were about half a dozen of us. We went down to the local train station and we leafleted for a week advertising a meeting to discuss this, this cut in, uh, in, in, in rail concessions. Uh, and we expected the usual, you know, if you've got 20 or 30, we'd do quite well. And 400 people turned up to a meeting in Barnsley Town Hall. Most of them not seasoned campaigners at all. People who were just really, really enraged by the fact that they weren't going to be able to travel around the area in the way that they had. And from that meeting, we launched a campaign that one of our campaigners said, why don't we call it Freedom Ride? Because it reminds people of the struggle for civil rights in the southern states of America. And our struggle was nothing like as serious or as deadly as that was. But it was a, a phrase that caught the imagination, I think. And here's a couple of pictures. The very first we decided what we were going to do was we we're going to travel on the train and refuse to pay uh, and have a campaign of civil disobedience. And this was the gathering on the first Monday uh, when the concession was meant to be slashed, where we all turned up to Bounty Station. There were a lot more of us than you can see on that picture. And you can see the constitution of it, a uh, very elderly group of people, a number of disabled as well. We got on the train uh, and we refused to pay. And we traveled to Meadowhall, which is a big shopping center in the outskirts of Sheffield. And we had an open air rally. Uh, and you can see from the picture on the train, but basically, we all sat together, we had placards, we sang songs and we showed the, uh, the guard our bus passes saying we're not going to pay because we don't agree that we should have to. And the mood is reflected, I think, in people's faces there. It was really exciting. People were really buoyed up by it. Uh, and having done it once, we then carried on for a whole number of weeks every week, turning up, uh, getting on the train in large numbers. A um, little bit of obstruction from the transport police, as you might might expect, but uh, but we managed to uh, to carry on our protests. About six weeks later, there was announcement of a partial victory. Disabled won back their rights. The elderly got partial half fare rather than free travel. Uh, but our meetings were very large, open air, democratic, as you can see, and the overwhelming majority of freedom riders agreed we wanted to carry on to get the free train travel back. So we carried on doing the sort of things and then what happened is we got waylaid at Sheffield station by the transport police and a couple of our leading members were arrested uh, and this is a picture from a video that actually went viral uh, of 64 year old man being manhandled there were actually seven British transport police around him and these two people Tony and and George were arrested and charged with evading fares and uh, resisting arrest. It's an interesting picture of a resisting arrest, isn't it? Um, the thing about that was that it actually, uh, it actually galvanized the campaign and broadened it as well. Uh, we were encouraged by a number of things to keep going. One was that the disabled had won a complete victory and we knew financially that there was no reason why we shouldn't get back what we were arguing for. But what happened with the arrests is that this actually went viral. Um, the national press took it up. We had articles in every national newspaper, I think, with that picture I've shown you. And huge levels of support came in, mainly from the trade union movement, but from other campaigners around. And we broadened out beyond rail and started looking at buses as well. And through our campaigning and our lobbying, we won a couple of concessions from bus companies that are up there. Um, that encourage people uh, to keep going. And until COVID, the Freedom Riders were actually still, we were still meeting fortnightly with up to 30 people attending every two weeks to discuss uh, continuing. You know, we lobbied, we demonstrated, we marched, we petitioned, we lobbied councillors, um, we lobbied MPs, you know, we, we did all the sort of usual campaigning things. Obviously things got very hard in COVID, I'll come on to that in a minute. Um, but the other thing that happened at the same point is that I, I'm a part of the uh, National Pensioners Convention in our region, Yorkshire and Humber, and we set up a transport group. Oops, sorry. Uh, right, I forgot about this slide. Right, this was just to show five years on, just um, 
the year before uh, lockdown came in, five years on, we were still amassing quite large numbers of people at our anniversary rally uh, outside um, Sheffield Station. So in, uh, in December 2019, uh, the YHPC, Yorkshire and Humber Pensioners Convention, created a transport manifesto. Uh, this came out of a conference that we had in Barnsley that attracted over 100 people. Again, we weren't expecting anything like that. And we heard lots of stories about the horrors that people were facing because of appalling uh, bus services. And we agreed we would launch a manifesto giving our principles as to what a bus service should look like. And I'll just read you the first couple of sentences, really, of the manifesto. Public transport should be a public service, not a source of private profit. So you know, I'd completely echo the remarks that Philip uh, made. Deregulation needs to be ended and buses return to public ownership under democratic control. This requires legislation from central government. However, we believe it's also crucial that local and regional bodies use their powers to influence national policies and to improve bus services for the benefit of local community, communities and to reduce carbon emissions. And part of that has become the campaign uh, that was referred to in, your, uh, in Ellie's contributions about Glasgow in trying to get South Yorkshire, um, where we have a regional mayor, uh, to, uh, to bring about uh, franchising, to introduce franchising. Uh, the situation in South Yorkshire is that um, uh, Dan Jarvis, our regional mayor, set up a bus review very, very quickly uh, when he first came into office in 2018. It took a long time to report. The report didn't come out until June 2020. Uh, but the, the conclusions of the report, we'd all concur with everything it said about how appalling everything was and the difficulties people had. Now, important it is that we have radical change. And the conclusions were that they should immediately begin the process of looking at franchising with the aim of if 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 enhanced partnerships didn't work and you know i can't talk now really about the the main problems with enhanced partnership enhanced partnerships but the evidence shows they don't actually challenge the real underlying problems but that if that didn't work that we could have franchising within three years but nothing has happened since the uh, the bus review um, concluded and was published in June 2020, at which point that is when the particular campaign in South Yorkshire was launched. Uh, and we, we've managed from the very beginning, really, to bring together people from trade unions, people from different climate campaigns across the county, transport campaigners, individuals who are interested in public transport. Uh, we have meetings that are a reasonable size. Um, and uh, in October, given that we couldn't do the kind of things that we would normally do, being out on the streets and doing the very visual things that the Freedom Riders had done, we launched a campaign uh, of posters and stickers that people put up around South Yorkshire in, uh, in, in, uh, in bus stops, calling on our mayor to come to a meeting to hear, uh, hear the views of the community and be pressured and to what, uh, what we wanted him to do. Uh, and this campaign was really successful. We had lots of people took posters and put them up in the local areas. We'd had a thousand printed and 500 stickers and I've now got uh, a handful of posters left. The rest of them have gone up in, in bus shelters and incidentally stayed there for a very long time until the passenger authority uh, came around and cleaned them off. But the stickers are still there because they're very hard to scrape off. Quite nice. So um, th this was the kind of thing we did. Uh, the red posters uh, were organised by the Yorkshire wide Better Buses campaign because they were doing the same sort of thing in West Yorkshire too. They're a little bit behind South Yorkshire. They don't have a, a regional mayor yet, but they're pushing for, um, a, you know, uh, for, for a, a commitment to franchising. But that was that's just some of the uh, the local bus stops uh, and what they looked like. And what was interesting, as I say, that the majority of these were not torn down. They were read by people who came uh, and waited for buses. And when we met people in bus stops like this group, so these are these are a group of passengers. They're not campaigners. Uh, there were people that one of our campaigners met when he went to stick the posters up. These are four people who worked on an industrial estate on the outskirts of Rotherham. They'd done an eight hour shift at a factory in Rotherham and they were, had waited two hours for a bus to arrive to take them back into the city centre. And, uh, and they were very, very pleased uh, to hold up our posters and be photographed and show the level 
of support that actually exists um, there. Um, I think it's really important that we try and make the campaigns as visible and as wide as possible. Obviously, a lot of it at the moment is driven onto online and social media tools, but um, we, we need to try and attract public attention and win the kind of public support that we need to put the pressure on. So the latest thing that we've done is created a, a, a draft motion with the arguments calling for action from the mayor and supporting the campaign, which we were pushing out to community groups as well as to trade union branches, Labour Party groups, campaign groups and so on to, to broaden and publicise and, and bring in those wider forces that we actually need. And I think really, for me, the message of the kind of campaigning that I've been engaged is, is we need to try and be imaginative as much as we can. And that, that, you know, catches attention in a way that we need to. We need to unite. We need to bring together all those forces that are, in, you know, that are affected by appalling public transport. And Philip and Ella, uh, Ellie have both mentioned some of them. And it's very important that we're part of the climate campaigns, I think. We need to build publicity, widen the support, but we also need to try and make it fun for people because it's great, isn't it, to be with other people who have the same sort of aim, uh, standing together uh, and, and showing our strength that comes from collective action, really. Uh, and I'll, I'll leave it there. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Fran. If you stop sharing your screen, you should be able to see your virtual round of applause. <laughs> which is coming right now <laughs> oh that's very nice there you go <laughs> that was really inspiring to see all the photos and everything fantastic Good. um right we what we're going to do now is we've got about well about 12 minutes left for this meeting so we're going to have some questions for fran but then also any other questions people want to ask bassam who's philip elston's um a collaborator is still on the call, so can answer any questions related to the project. But Susan's going to kick us off with a question for Fran. And then I've also already picked one out of the chat to follow. And I'll look in the chat for a few more now. Thanks, Fran. I mean, that was such a brilliant and really concrete example of the argument that Philip Alston was making that transport is a, is a human right and a civil rights issue. And you're actually uh, taking it up and, and, and uh, organising around that in Yorkshire, which is absolutely fantastic to see. Um, but you also talked about really the fact that you are having to campaign in this way to get your mayor to take up franchising, um, which they, they've got the powers to do. And I just wondered what you thought um, lies at the heart, is at the root of the resistance to re-regulation and franchising? Why, why is that? Why are, why are you having to campaign in this way, do you think? Do you want me to come straight back, Ellie, or do you want to? Yeah, you answer that yeah. one, Fran, and then I'll, I'll give you another couple. Um, I think this is a couple of reasons. Um, I think the impact of neoliberalism means that even among people we'd think of as natural allies, like Labour Party leaders, um, there's an acceptance, isn't there, that um, the privatisation is going to stay. Uh, and I think, you know, there's a political resistance. But there's also uh, the fact that if you look at the situation in Newcastle, where they started going down the road of looking at franchising and the bus companies threatened massive legal action and the council backed off they were afraid of the costs that would be incurred. Uh, there's the fact that with that, franchising is a massive step forward and I think we need to argue like hell for it, but we've also got to argue for better funding because I think one of the other reasons that, that um, councils and powers that be are reluctant is because they feel that all the flack that is currently going to the bus companies will be focused on them if they don't actually improve services and they won't improve them if they don't have the funding, they can take away some of the profit motive and things could improve a little bit, but you know, people would have expectations quite rightly. And uh, so I think there's a fear there as well. Um, but I, I've always been an optimist and I think people power is very strong uh, and the power of the unions is very strong when it has the confidence to be used. And I think 
we can put a counterbalance that that can start to change things. I hope so. Anyway, <laughs> that's uh, that's why I keep fighting. Brilliant. I hope Thank that you. Answers the question. <laughs> I've got a couple more questions for you, um, Fran. So Linda Bamford has asked, how did you manage to get, very specific question, how did you manage to get the free transport to medical appointments and how did that work? And then there was another question from Roz who was asking, let me see if I can find the exact question. Um, did people who got involved with your campaign start to think about other issues that link with public transport and engage with those white with those wider actions as well? Right. OK, um, two brilliant questions. Um, but first of all, the bus companies and the um, the travel to hospitals. Um, we decided that we didn't like stagecoach for reasons I probably don't need to explain to a Scottish audience, I think. <laughs> um, uh, and we particularly, um, we, were, we were very annoyed that we couldn't use our bus passes before 9.30. So we decided that, um, that the hospital thing was something that was worth going and, and arguing with Stagecoach about. So we, we focused our lobbying on them for a while. Uh, we were asking for other things. We were asking for cheap, cheaper half price before 9.30 and things like that on the buses. Um, uh, and they and they conceded in the end the 9:30. And what how it works is that when you get on the bus, and it applies to a carer who travels with you as well, if you can show an appointment letter for the hospital, uh, you will allow to just get on with your bus pass. Uh, and that uh, that works quite effectively. I mean, we've had to do quite a job trying to publicise it because of course stagecoach don't let people know that they can do it. But I think the word has got round quite widely we still come across people who aren't aware of it and it's just a little concession but it is important isn't it that you know that hospitals are very good at putting very early morning appointments on and things like that these days but what we had less success with is trying to get first who are the other major operator in South Yorkshire to do the same thing they, they absolutely dug their heels in and wouldn't move at all uh, despite all our efforts so it was very much up I think to the regional manager of Stagecoach who also, by the way, just a little anecdote, I know we're short of time, but I must tell you this, I was at a bus transport users meeting with the stagecoach and they put on a new expense service between Leeds and Sheffield, uh, between Barnsley and Sheffield, which is about 26 miles up the M1. Uh, and he actually said, we had a meeting to decide fare structures and we decided we ought to give the Freedom Riders something. So we'll let pensioners travel before 9.30 for three pounds instead of the seven pounds um, single fare that we're charging. Uh, and we haven't even asked for it. Uh, it was great. It was obviously in their uh, in their in their thoughts that uh, we'd be awkward. Um, and I think that's one of the lessons. You have to be awkward. You have to make a noise, and you have to make life miserable for people. And then perhaps they'll try and make you go away. Um, the other other question was: uh, Did people get involved in wider issues? Yes, in terms of austerity, because they saw very much uh, the fact that our free travel was cut. Uh, was blamed on austerity, blamed partly on the councils, but also on national governments who were cutting money to local councils. So uh, not everybody, but a lot of the people involved in the Freedom Rise campaign also supported campaigns against austerity, against cuts, particularly to the health service, which is, of course, something else that's a very deep concern to us all, but older people in particular. So there was some broadening out um, politically of that which I think is very good because we need to link all these issues together. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Fran. I'm afraid we are coming to the end of our time and I've been trying to keep an eye on the chat. There's been quite a healthy debate in there about local and regional governance structures, about the difference between England and Scotland, that we don't have a mayor in Scotland um, and we don't have a, any kind of regional um, governance anymore. Um, we've got the, the Glasgow City region cabinet, but it's not really representative of, of the whole region. Um, so I think there's a few unanswered questions, but I'm very pleased to say that we have got some um, some of our elected representatives on the call as well. I can see John Mason, MSP, is here, Glasgow Councillor Graham Campbell. So thank you for coming along. Hopefully you'll be taking some of these messages back. Um, so we are, um, if we haven't had a chance to answer your question, we're going to be saving the chat from um, 
this meeting and the committee will be going through all of that and it will inform our campaigning going forward. Um, I just wanted to end the meeting by reminding you to take action. Um, if you are a Glasgow resident, please take a few minutes to write to your councillors to demand that they use the powers that are now available to them in, um, in the Transport Act to re-regulate the buses and not to lock us into this partnership, which will be locking us into privatisation for years to come. Gavin has put the link in the chat again. So, um, we, yeah, we are now going to wrap up this meeting um, and go over to our AGM, which is happening on another Zoom call. So everybody who's a Get Glasgow Moving member should have received an email from Susan um, earlier today with the link to the next um, Zoom call. So we're going to head over to that now. But bef before we do that, I'd just like to give one more big virtual round of applause to both of our speakers today, Fran from Yorkshire and Philip Alston from New York and Batam still on the call to see all of that appreciation. So thank you very much. Um, can, I, can, I just, can I just say, Ellie, I've just posted in the chat a link that people can see to the manifesto and also my email. Um, if you send me a copy of the chat, I'll, I'll pick up any questions that people have got that I can deal with if you want and send you responses. I'm that's happy to fantastic. do that. That's fantastic. Yeah. Thank you so much. Okay, that's fine. Yeah, it's been a pleasure. Thank you. You're welcome to come to our AGM if you want, Fran. It's going um, to be an update. on. <laughs> it's another hour. <laughs> uh, yeah, the trouble is, this is my fourth meeting today. It's been one of those yeah. really horrendous <laughs> meetings. So I think I need to, to slow down and have a glass of wine and relax a bit. That's fair <laughs> but enough. Thank you very much for the offer. And do keep me in touch with what's going on, because I think we need to link campaigns together, don't we? Around Absolutely. Your, yeah, yes. so much in, um, in common, really. Power in numbers. Yeah. Brilliant. OK, so if anybody who's a member who doesn't know how to get on to the AGM, um, either check your emails because you will have had an email from Susan earlier today or stay on the call. Gavin is going to stay on the call and and help you. Um, but otherwise, thank you very much. Good night. <laughs>